What's going on, everyone? This is Decred in Depth. I'm your host, Angelo. And today we have a special guest, Permable Nino in here. Jordan, how are you? I'm doing good, man. Just stacking some Decred. So let's get right into it. What's your background and how did you find Bitcoin and crypto assets? So I just graduated college in 2015, moved to New York City, passed uh, all four parts of the CPA, was an accounting major in college, stayed, stuck around for a fifth year, moved to New York, worked for Ernst & Young. And in that period of time, when I first moved here, I immediately knew that accounting was not going to be my career. You know, I was an accountant by trade, and I really liked the skill set that it brought to the table. I thought it laid a good foundation for me for the rest of my life. So with that in mind, I was constantly exploring other things. I was reading a bunch of books on tech-related stuff, financial-related stuff, historical stuff, anthropology, just everything across the board. And then one day through my obsessive uh, little educational, like, rampage I went on. I found the A16Z podcast where Paul Vinya was talking and kind of, uh, you know, promoting his book, uh, The Cryptocurrency Revolution, something along those lines. And it immediately piqued my interest because, you know, we'd all heard about Bitcoin in college, you know, like I was a junior or sophomore in college when like Silk Road was super popular and whatnot. And I was like, oh, like drug dealer, internet money. One of me and one of my buddies actually used to crack jokes about uh, how there was this one dude at Georgia who had a ton of Bitcoins. We're like, yeah, let's go take his Bitcoins. And, you know, in reality, like we didn't even know how to move a Bitcoin. So it's like, yeah, that's a stupid idea. But um, so that whole thing went down. And then, yeah, so after listening to that podcast, though, I kind of went down the rabbit hole, read a bunch of books, end of 2015, early January 2016, bought my first Bitcoin. Six months later, I understood the whole thing of Bitcoin, not blockchain, why basically you need the incentive token to make these accounting networks run and why they're necessary and why like private blockchains are just like, you know, a joke basically and why we don't really need need them. And uh, at that point, I went all in financially and, you know, just mentally and emotionally on Bitcoin and crypto. And then from there, you know, the rest is kind of just history for me. So with your background as a CPA and in accounting, how do you see accounting playing a role in crypto? So for me, accounting is part of the foundation. I would argue it is the foundation of this revolution. You know, we talk a lot about distributed systems, cryptography, coding, and all that jazz. And in reality, you know, all those, all those different pieces move together to create an accounting system. And more specifically, the ultimate accounting system, right? When Bitcoin, what Satoshi did in terms of accounting is that he created the ultimate accounting scheme that provides us with the first time in history the ability to attain absolute assurance over the entries found within a ledger, right? So I would say it's just the central piece and it is the foundation for value accrual, right? Everybody that bought into uh, you know, Bitcoin in the early days, I talked about this in my article, Assurances in Crypto. The first thing that Satoshi talks about, he doesn't really, st- like within the white paper, there isn't a whole lot of discussion about Bitcoins themselves. He talks about the network, right? He goes through like the six different steps of running the network and how it adds up and how he solves the double spending problem. So in my opinion, like I argued in the piece, the Assurances in Crypto article, is that the the accounting layer, the base layer, the ledger layer, the consensus layer, um, that is the central point for value accrual and the ultimate expansion in terms of the monetary revolution that we're currently undergoing. So how does ledger assurance play a role? So ledger assurance is just at a high level, right? You know, in accounting... Uh, at the end of the day, right, you know, these companies, they go through a financial year and at the end of the year, they get audited because they need to, before they prevent, prevent, present financial statements to prospective investors and current stakeholders in the company, they want to make sure that the balances are actually correct, right? So when I talk about ledger assurance, I mean, are the balances correct? And how, what is the level of, what is the degree of reliability that we can put on the ledger balances that are being presented, right? So when I talk about ledger assurances in crypto, I'm, th- I'm asking, what are the odds that money is not being double spent, basically, right? No double spends. Is the consensus ledger correct? Are the inputs greater than the outputs? And that's pretty much like what it's all about. And then, you know, we, you do it through three different ways, popularly known. There's like a bunch of small little different ways that it differs, but, um, you know, it just at a high level. That's where you have did the different accounting systems that are in play in the crypto, syst- the crypto ecosystem are proof of work, proof of stake, and then hybrid proof of work, proof of stake. And uh, yeah, so that's like, that's ledger assurances just at a high level for everybody. So how does the accounting first approach change the way you look at allocating capital into the space? So for me, it changes everything. You know, we, uh, you know, like in 2017, we had 
we kind of had like this weird uh, euphoric, but also like I think a lot of people that were like kind of scratching their heads, like this weird existential issue as to why would I buy anything outside of Bitcoin, right? There's just like so many different altcoins, like all these ICO tokens that just like they're, the incentives are completely screwed. And like, it just didn't, nothing was making sense that year. And I think, you know, that's a good thing about 2018. We cooled off, we had a lot of time to think about this stuff. And that's what I spent majority of 2018 thinking about outside of like, you know, Decred ticket data, which we can get into later. But um, it changes the way you look at the space in terms of at the end of the day, what you really want to do is hold the coins with the most reliable accounting schemes. Because as I argued earlier, the accounting scheme is the focal point, the foundation for future value accrual. So um, yeah, it changes everything. So basically that's why I argue these days when people ask me like, so long-term investing, how would you long-term invest in the space? I say, you want to own the dominant POW coin, which is Bitcoin. You want to own the dominant hybrid proof of work, proof of stake coin, which is Decred. And then you could argue that you might want to own the dominant um, proof of stake coin. But the problem is like, there are issues that have been thrown out there that I completely, uh, as of today, agree with and understand why you would not want to hold a proof of stake coin. But I guess, yeah, there, there's an argument to be made though that you want to hold the dominant proof of stake coin. But basically though, high level, you want to hold the dominant coins within an accounting scheme. Understood. And how do privacy coins play into this with the ledger being obfuscated? So this is just a big topic that I like to hit on a lot, you know, once you cover the base layer stuff like the POW, POW, POS, and POS, um, in terms of privacy coins, you know, within 2017, there was a lot, a lot of chatter outside of the ICO mania, you know, in terms of just cryptocurrency coin holdings that you want to hold the dominant privacy coin, you want to hold the dominant programmability coin, and you want to hold the dominant throughput coin, and then the dominant store of value coin. Or, or and also maybe you can argue the dominant governance coin, right? So, but just to focus on the throughput, uh, programmability, and privacy, right? Let's specifically talk about Monero for a second, like you asked, though, right? So the thing is with privacy, it's not an outright improvement, right? It's a trade-off. When you get privacy on the base layer ledger, the trade-off that you're making is auditability of that ledger, right? If something goes wrong, you might not be able to catch it, right? Like we had that whole issue with Zcash, right? They found out that there was an inflation bug in Zcash, and to this day, if I... Somebody's welcome to correct me on Twitter or whatever after this, but as I understand it, they weren't even sure if like the inflation bug had, inflation bug had been exploited. And there's been people speculating, you know, if you've looked at the Zcash chart, it's like it's like a joke. It looks horrible, just constantly down. And somebody's been speculating maybe somebody exploited the inflation bug and has just been dumping it on the market over time, right? Which is kind of scary. So that's like the issue with privacy, but to hit on like programmability, for example, there's a lot of talk about blockchain bloat with Ethereum, whatnot. And the problem with blockchain bloat is that it, some people are having trouble running nodes and running nodes is a huge deal. You need that redundancy. These are highly redundant, uh, high reliability accounting networks, right? And that's an issue with that. And then with throughput, you have the same problem, you know, like bandwidth and stuff like that with bigger blocks and whatnot, like B, Bcash and BSV, you know, there's been like a lot of issues surrounding that. So the issue at the end of the day though, with a lot of these things, including Monero, which like you and me have talked like, you know, privately about like, Tons of respect for Monero, like a lot of privacy coins, especially the Monero dudes like Cypherpunky. Uh, it's, it's definitely a great project. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I have nothing wrong with the project and I completely understand the argument for privacy. So I get it and I'm all about it. The problem that I have with privacy though is that it is not enough of a competitive moat because it's only a trade-off. It's not an outright improvement. It's not enough of a competitive moat to argue to hold it for it to become a premium store of value. And that's my, that's my main issue with privacy, programmability, and throughput though. So what attracted you to Decred? So right off the bat, the first thing that I noticed about Decred was that it was hybrid proof of work, proof of stake. So just for like a little bit of background though. So um, during the whole bull market, I was traveling. I quit my job. I went with three of my buddies and we traveled through Asia for six months. And, you know, throughout the whole process, you know, it was like fun, euphoric and everything. And I, but towards the end, I got kind of worn out and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go back to the United States. I'm going to put my head down and just dive into crypto head first, right? So I start looking. I was only in Bitcoin at the time. I dumped all my ETH. I was done with ETH. I was only in Bitcoin. And, you know, I went through this whole period where I was just constantly looking for projects. I'm just like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't know why I would hold this over Bitcoin. And then it was actually pretty funny. I was pretty close to just giving that whole thing up. I was like, you know, I'll just hold, you know, Bitcoin, it's whatever. And then I, was, I started thinking, you know what? If I'm doing this full time, I got to like, pay bills, I guess, right? So I was like, I need some sort of income coming in. And I found Decred. And then from there, download Decred a ton. 
bought some. And I, yeah, you can laugh. I kind of bought, I bought some at the top, like basically at the top. Laugh, but you don't want to hear my story. Uh, yeah, we, we've, we've all gotten a little bit wrecked. But, you know, like at the time I was just like, I'm very thankful actually for getting wrecked though on Decred because – it got me into the project. You know, you get your foot in the door, you get some skin in the game, as we like to talk about in Decred. I had skin in the game, had, t- had, had a couple of tickets, started staking, and was running Decrediton. And, you know, from there, I just fell in love with the project. You know, it's, it's like I tell a lot of people, Bitcoin's a massive rabbit hole, especially once you understand why Bitcoin, not blockchain. Decred is the next biggest, most exciting just rabbit hole that you just can't dig yourself out of. There's like, there's no bottom to the rabbit hole. It's insane. So... Yeah, and that's that's my decred uh, genesis story. So, so what's what's the correlation between the consensus algorithm and accounting? Because I saw you break that down. So, get into that with decred. Yeah. So, you know, let, let's kick things off with Bitcoin really quick because you know most people are familiar with Bitcoin. They understand the POW model at a high level. So, um, in a piece I'm actually that I'm going to publish soon, it's called Bitcoin and Accounting Revolution. And within that piece, I argue that accounting systems have three core pillars. Redundancy, which in my opinion is the most important, tamper resistance, and then transparency. But the invention of Bitcoins, what Satoshi did, he solved the transparency pillar, right? We have a transparent ledger, right? So you always know what's going on. And when you think about transparency, and if you don't understand that at a high level, for example, right, transparency has it as it relates to the current you know, traditional financial markets, right? Transparency, like every year companies po- uh, publish their 10K, which is just like their financial, their annual financial statements. And every quarter they publish the 10Q, which is just their quarterly financials, right? So that's transparency. It's like a key part of every accounting system. So what Satoshi did though, is that he, uh, he created an extra layer of redundancy um, by motivating people to, the, by motivating people by mining, right? There's a profit motive in mining. So, by that, a lot of people wanted to join the network and validate transactions, right? A bunch of miners joined the network. And then tamper resistance, because mining is expensive, it's expensive to tamper with the ledger, right? So it solves all three accounting pillars. So that's how Bitcoin works, right? The problem with Bitcoin, though, and this is where Decred steps in in a big way, in my opinion, in terms of you know, pushing this accounting paradigm forward in the whole space at large, is that... Um, there's three parts. There's a thing called segregation of duties in accounting systems. And there's three, the three parts, the three duties are custody, authorization, and recording. The problem with Bitcoin as it stands today is that recording is done by all nodes, mining, non-mining nodes, economic nodes, right? That's done by all those three. So nobody actually dominates that pillar, which is a good thing, right? The problem is that right now, Custody and authorization are dominated by miners. And the whole rule with segregation of duties just at a high level is that if one party dominates or owns two of the three, at least two of the three, they uh, malicious behavior can slip through the cracks basically, right? So with Bitcoin, with the miners, they get authorization, they get custody by creating the blocks, right? They find a hash below the difficulty target, block created, propagated to the network, right? Then with authorization though, that same signature, the the hash below the difficulty target also effectively serves as a signature, right? They are, as long, so as long as everything that's going on in that block is falls within consensus rules, it's good to go. And the issue with this whole thing is you think like, oh, what's the issue? Like Bitcoin makes blocks every 10 minutes. And at a high level, Bitcoin, Works very well, by the way. I'm also a big Bitcoin bull, but this happened to be a Decred podcast, so we're we're gonna stick to that. Um, but the thing is, with the the big issue with that is like, for example, you want to like people are like, oh, so like, how is it getting abused? Like, what's the big deal? We see it all the time, you know. Uh, you know, in the middle of like the whole block debate, right? A lot of the miners just to stick it to the community were mining empty blocks, and that still happens today, you know. So where Decred steps in though is that it. It breaks all three duties in the segregation of duties pillars, custody, authorization, and recording to be dominated only by one party, right? So nobody owns any two verticals, right? So all nodes record transactions, miners custody blocks by creating them, and then stakers authorize block, tran- uh, authorize block v- validity. So at that point, nobody can, do- nobody can dominate any two verticals and also nobody can nobody's incentivized and nobody has the venue to indulge in malicious behavior. So that's where Decred really changes the game in a big way. And it's 
the thing that blows my mind is that like the market at large, like just the crypto market and then like everything else, everybody's like, nobody's paying attention. It's crazy. It blows my mind. So now I've also seen that you've done work with the ticket data. You've posted several tweets in regards to your work on how the ticket data is a mechanism for holding? Yes. So I guess just to, you know, kick things off with the tickets, I, I, guess, I guess I before we dive into that, I can talk a little bit about, you know, what made me want to get into tickets, right? You know, it's like, initially, I was just like, I got into Decrediton, I bought a ticket, and I was just like, this is just a very, very interesting tool. But yeah, so I spent a lot of time looking through ticket data. And the number one thing that you realize about tickets is that there's, a, you know, with for example, you know, like in Bitcoin, you like look at transactions and stuff like that. There's a lot of different ways to figure out what the holding demand is of this money, right? Because at the end of the day, the way uh, money is valued is that the demand to hold dictates the value of that money, correct? So with tickets, I was like, there is a very, very explicit intent to hold some DCR when you're buying a ticket, right? You're locking your decred up in a ticket that could expire within one day. When I say, no, expire is a bad word actually in decred, that's not right. Vote within a day or it'll vote four months later, right? The thing is, and that's a predefined window of when the voting actually occurs, right? So that's super interesting. And then also the fact that it's like a predefined window that's quite predictable, that's short to medium term is interesting. And then on top of that, it's pseudo random, right? Like you don't know when your ticket's gonna vote, right? So when you combine a lot of these different things, what's super, super interesting is that it is a gr- you realize, wow, this is a great tool for evaluating and trying to extrapolate what type of things pro- rational profit-seeking motivated actors are thinking and behaving and what they're doing with their money when profit and whatnot is on the line. So that's what keeps me up at night when I, when it comes to like tickets and whatnot. So what have you learned so far from studying the ticket data? So what I've learned about tickets, which is very interesting is that, you know, usually with proof of stake systems, a lot of people talk trash about proof of stake systems and they're like, all the money just ends up in one group of people's hands, right? Because if you get in early, you just can constantly stake at no cost and you can just keep doing that till you own, like you can maintain that portion of that supply throughout the rest of the way. So first of all, just to kill that rumor with Decred at least, right? The, the only 30% of the block reward go to stakers. So they're, they're constantly getting diluted by the block reward anyways. But another thing that's super interesting, and I can tweet about this, you know, actually Leo Zhang actually gave me this idea from Iterative um, to make this tool where I have this thing that I track, it's called the DCR AFS. It's Decred available for sale. And it's a way to estimate um, how many decred are becoming available every time uh, a ticket window, which is 144 blocks, expires, right? How many, like, based on the deficit or... Because, you know, with decred tickets, just to, before I even go further into this D, DCR AFS, every 144 blocks, the expectation, the mean, the average, is uh, that 720 tickets will be purchased. And this is another fun fact about decred tickets, is that it's supposed to be 720 that are purchased every 12 hours on average, that actually happens. You know, I have like close to like uh, a thousand instances stored of decred ticket data over the past uh, chunk of time and it holds true, right? So the way DCR AFS works though, is that uh, beyond a certain point, right? Anything above 720, because 720 tickets are getting released every 144 blocks. The, you just take the deficit or the surplus and you can figure out how many decred are coming off the market or coming onto the market that are available for sale. But what I've learned through this tool though is that decred at key points, first of all, decred are constantly switching hands, even in the proof of stake pool, right? Decred are constantly switching hands, but particularly at key moments in the market when I tweeted about this quite recently, you can look at one of my recent tweets because I don't tweet that much, but there is a, there's a gigantic amount of turnover at certain points in the market where a lot of volatility comes, whether it be up or down. So that's like another thing that I've learned about decred tickets. Um, I'm trying to think about anything else top of mind, but um, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's all I got for right now. So f- from what I'm gathering, people's willingness to hold using the tickets as a metric 
is the fact that it's locked up from one day to four months? Yes, exactly. So, you know, that, that's the thing. It, it's so- and there's, and there's another metric in there too. Th there's another metric? So the lockup from one to four months? Yeah. And you would say- Oh, and then the fact that it's pseudo random, right? Because- Correct. When you, when, you know, when randomness gets baked into anything, you, you need to think twice before you make decisions, right? 100%. Yeah, and you know what's like very interesting is, you know, you look at some of these master node models. I don't know if you like looked into some of these. I don't know if you looked in some of the master node models though, which is really, I looked at, so here's like a little tidbit. Uh, for a little while, I was a volunteer researcher at Masari. They like had like a big, like little, big analyst community that right. people were just volunteering their time to write up these bios of coins. And, you know, for example, I looked into this one coin, I'm not going to name it, but it's a, uh, it's a relatively well-known coin that has a master node model. Um, and there's, the fact that, you know, with Decred, it's pseudo random, right? You don't know when you're going to get your tickets going to vote and when you're going to receive your yield for voting and protecting the, protecting the network, voting on proposals and whatnot, right? And signaling for consensus changes. With this, with these master nodes, sometimes it, it's very bizarre, but um, the reason why I don't look into these master node coins in terms of like evaluating staking data, right? Is it because your turn's predictable? It's because pre it's predictable, right? Yeah, exactly. You, they, they have like an order. They have these websites where you can literally look at the order, like where you land in the pecking order and the batting order to receive your reward. So to me, I'm just like, you know, when you're receiving a constant yield and you know exactly when it's going to happen, that like, I just can't, maybe, maybe I'm wrong though, right? I could be completely wrong. No, no, it, ma it makes total sense. I, I could see how the randomness of it and the time, it's, it's a total risk and it does show a willingness to hold. Yeah. 100%, I agree with you on all of that. Um, yeah, it's very explicit. What are your thoughts on Decred's current governance infrastructure and how have your views evolved over time? So it's very funny. I, uh, for a while, I thought the whole governance thing was like a very meme like almost gimmicky and my views have completely flipped. So. The thing, so this, a lot of this actually, to this person's credit, Murad, we've spoken a lot about Decred um, over time. And, you know, he's talked, you know, he's convinced me the importance of the social layer, you know, with Bitcoin, you know, they have the anarchic governance scheme and they, as far as I'm concerned, they are, I mean, not as far as I'm concerned, it's matter of fact, they are the dominant coin using that model, right? And there's a lot of other coins that they're like, oh, we're like, basically in an ass kissing fashion, they're like, oh, we're anarchic too. And we're just like, for that reason, it's like almost uh, virtue signaling a little bit to like have an anarchic scheme. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. But over time, I've become much more bullish on Decred's governance scheme. And the number one thing that I think a lot of people do not realize about the governance scheme is that it requires an overwhelming amount of support to push anything through. And that's a big deal, right? You know, when it comes to like these governance schemes, just at a high level though, before I dive a little further into what I was talking about, is that there's a pendulum to these, you know, the, to the governance schemes. It either has very high mental costs or a high degree of gameability, right? With Bitcoin, they have, Bitcoin has very high mental costs. Like how long did that, the block size debate go on, right? And then when it ended, it was a shit show too. Fortunately, we were in a bull market when all that happened. I'm not convinced that like, I think if the Bcash fork had happened during the bear market, we would have dumped. But it happens to be that after the Bcash fork, we ripped up after yeah, I that. Can, I can see that. So yeah, so like there's two degrees though, to the end, to just to hit on this before I move forward. Uh, high, uh, high mental cost or a high degree, high, highly easily gameable, right? So with Bitcoin, they go for high mental cost to make it very difficult to game, right? Because they can't, you can't coordinate anything in Bitcoin, which is, to an extent, it is a positive with the way Bitcoin works. With Decred though, what I like about it a lot is that it plays a middle ground, right? So uh, just like to, you know, when you think about it, right? High degree of gameability, when you think about it, 75% of tickets and 95% of hash rate, if I'm not mistaken, are required to push through a consensus change to even just get it to voting, right? That's just to, to lock in a voting period or something like that, if I'm, not, if I'm not wrong about that. So that's very difficult to game. So you've already eliminated the bad end of that spectrum, the easily, highly gameable stuff. And then when you move to the other end, high mental cost, 
the mental costs aren't very high, right? The the governance model in my eyes is highly predictable. You know exactly what you're getting into when it comes time to vote or push through consensus changes. You know the rules. We know the rules. We talk about them all the time, right? So in that regard, I'm I'm very bullish with the way Decred has implemented its governance scheme, and it's certainly evolved over time. And then one more point on this. Um, you know, when people talk about, you know, like secure and adaptable, adaptability is very interesting, right? Everybody just assumes that the adaptability, it's a sword that cuts two ways in a good and bad way, right? Uh, adaptability can be one of those things that you think, oh, the project can move forward and push through changes very easily, right? But at the same time, because the rules are so explicit and the overwhelming amount of support you need to push through a consensus change is so high, it can move as slow as Bitcoin if it wants to. And you, everybody knows the rules too, right? right? So if you want to push through a change, you like it needs to be convincing. And the good thing is, yeah, the rules are explicitly stated up front. But yeah, Decred can move. When, so when you think about adaptable, the whole point I'm trying to make is that Decred can move as fast as it wants or as slow as it wants, which is a beautiful thing, right? If you have bad actors in the system, you want to move slow. But fortunately with Decred, we're small enough right now, but at the same time, it's just a lot of people that are on the same wavelength and there's a lot of good self-policing that goes on in the Decred community, but there will be a time when this project eventually gets bigger and we are going to want to move slower. And the rules are very explicit and stated up front. So adaptability, it's a good thing. It, it cuts both ways. It's not just a thing where you just fly forward. Correct. Touching back on governance for a bit, actually in conversation with Jay-Z recently, he brought something to my attention that I did not think about. Um, a use for Politea as a signal before a consensus change is implemented. So you could actually have a rough idea of what the community is going to think of if you throw it up on Politea before it goes into the... Oh, I love that. I mean, yeah, that's the thing. It's just the, the beautiful... Before it's put on to vote uh, for an on-chain vote. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great idea. And it's one of those things, it's like, uh, it's like soft signaling, right? Like it's Essentially, yes. Yeah, that's what, that is what it is. Yeah, it's just off-chain. And you know, the beautiful thing, what Decred is going on right now, I tell a lot of people about, I tell a lot of people about this. Uh, I've talked to Murad about this. I'm just like, the Decred community and just like the core that has been built with this project, these guys know how to bootstrap money. You know what I'm saying? Like all this different stuff, all the different tools that people are building, like Polytail, like there's so, Murad's gonna be a really good person to talk about some of this stuff though, but um, just the, all the different pieces that are flowing together, it just, it lever, it's every, so many different pieces can just be leveraged in so many different ways to push forward the project and push forward the project under the project's ideal, ideals, set of ideals and its own terms. So I think that's a great idea though. It's dope. Definitely. What are some of the narratives for Decred that are top of mind for you? Um, so this is a big one for me. I think one of those things, if Decred really starts outperforming the market, you know, we talked about it. We've talked, we, a lot of us talk about this with Decred. It's super secure, right? And with Zubay, Zubay or Zia, his, his epic set of articles where he described Decred security in comparison to Bitcoin and Ethereum and some other coins, if Decred really starts outperforming, there will be some chatter about Decred becoming the most secure network in terms of dollar cost to attack the network, to 51% attack the network. And this is one of those things that I like to call robust marketing schemes, right? It's a marketing scheme that when you tell, when let's say I sell Decred to you, I'm like, you should buy some Decred and you buy Decred under the, the expectation that it's a very secure coin, right? The price goes up it starts becoming more secure. Price goes up more, more secure. That sells you more to buy more Decred. It's robust. With size, with scale, it blows up in a good way. So with Decred, um, that is my top of mind thing. I'm looking for when Decred starts to outperform, there will be a lot of discussion. It will either, it'll probably start within the community and then it'll expand outwards. But there will be a lot of discussion about Decred becoming the most sec most expensive coin. I'm not going to say most secure because that's like a very broad word. Most expensive coin to attack on a dollar basis. What are your thoughts on coin-specific maximalism? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so coin-specific maximal maximalism, you know, the, here's the thing. The, like to the Bitcoiners' credit, they've been right, <laughs> you know, almost the entire time, right? Like, and as far as I'm concerned, at least using my, uh, 
long-term outlook on the space and the way I like to invest my money in this space, I am pretty close to a maximalist myself. So there's nothing wrong with maximalism as long as it's done, you know, you kind of like stay in your lane, right? Like nobody wants a like negative person bringing like bad vibes and, you know, just trashing another project and dragging them through the mud for like no reason. But I, you know, for me, like I'm just like, I'm, I'm an example of maximalism to some extent, right? I spend all of my time thinking about Bitcoin and Decred because those are the only two coins that I'm willing to hold. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to, you know, constantly think about other projects and, you know, try to like give them the pat on the head, even though in re reality, I don't believe in them. So to an extent, I think maximalism is very, you know, justifiable to an extent, as long as you're not negative about it, you know, just keep promoting your own projects, stick to your ideals and do your thing. But yeah, I mean, I put all of my money and time into Bitcoin and Decred, so I'm a maximalist. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> So what are some of the long-term concerns you have for Decred in the future? What are some of the holes that you see in the project? I don't, I don't know if I necessarily see any holes. The thing is with Decred is that there's so many big things that Decred's trying to tackle over time, right? So in reality, though, I will say, like, I've become more bullish on the governance scheme. But my biggest fear is that over time, when the masses come in, they overrun some of the core community, right? So that's the thing. We just need to keep people engage with the project. And that's a good thing about the project. It does keep you engaged, right? Like if you, you stake tickets, you, you're involved in governance, you know, the miner's mine and everything like that. But if not enough, you know, if enough bad actors come in and take over and start running the show, you yeah. know, they can push through whatever they want. We, we, we know this is an experiment at the end of the day. And my greatest concern is DCR's governance has not fully been tested yet. And it will be when, when the project grows. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, so that's why, um, you know, like I, like I said, I've become a lot more bullish on the governance scheme, but when I try to sell Decred to people, you know, and I'm like, you should look into this project. I don't make governance the first thing I talk about, which I think is a change of tune a little bit. Cause I think historically the project, uh, I'm not sure if the project has marketed itself this, itself this way, or if the external community has always viewed it this way, but you know, Decred's like widely known as a governance coin. Um, whereas I view it as a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake coin, because I think, you know, just the thing that I can sell easier that I already know for a fact works and will work at scale is the security scheme. Over, over the governance. Yeah, because like you said, you know, we haven't been fully tested yet. But the beautiful thing that's going on right now, though, is that with the governance scheme, the number one thing, you know, people talk about this in law all the time, right? Setting precedents. And the precedents being set right now, you know, we've, I don't know. I can't. I I, I don't track all the uh, the Politea data, but you know, there's been enough proposals pushed through and presented, and enough rejected at this point that there is a precedent being set. Like, what is what is the Treasury willing to spend money on? What are we willing to bend the rules for? What you know? What do we believe in as a project? So you know, you know, the precedent's being set, and as long as that precedent keeps to being set, and the like, the line holds and pushing forward in the right direction, you know, I think that Decred governance, it's one of those things that if you build it the right way and you get it to scale, it's going to be an absolute monster. Like it's going to be like a force to be reckoned with. So bullish, optimistic, but cautiously optimistic in terms of, uh, you know, all of that. <laughs> so give me your emotional state with the relation of Decred in one word. Hyper dash bullish i guess that's the best way to describe it i'm just like it's not a word, man. Yeah, it's technically one word but um bullish i guess i don't know excited uh a little bit nervous you know coming out of the bear market you know uh you know anytime the price goes down for an extended period of time you know you, you invest a lot of time and energy into something you know you start to get like a you know a little bit concerned you're like oh am i making the right decision is this right but that was like a that was more of like an, a crypto existential question that came into play for a second but i just think the thesis is just too strong you know like these are just like you know for example non sovereign digital unseizable uninflatable money you know that is not going anywhere and the value prop for that is so big and that in conjunction with you know the stuff i constantly harp on where the fact that we have uh finally accounting systems with unit, you know, with ledger balances that provide us with an absolute degree of assurance is just remarkable. Right. So, you know, at, and because Decred just does it so well, it's one of those things that right now, you know, the price is low, you know, even like, 
it's relatively low. I think the project is stupid cheap right now, just to be completely honest. And, you know, it makes you start to question things, but I am just, I'm either right in a big way or I'm either wrong in a big way, but I just think that the the accounting scheme that Decred leverages and then just everything that comes with it, you know, like the community, the devs, you know, like all the all the synergies that comes with the different, you know, Decred based, uh, you know, applications that come with it. it. It just is so compelling that I just can't, you know, even if price is down, I am just so positive about the project at this point. I just can't ignore it. So yeah, hyper bullish. That's my word. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> So this is a question I ask everyone. Uh, what advice would you give Satoshi? Um, I don't know. It would be for me, you know, on the turn, on the on the note of not being Greg right. It would be it would be very interesting. At least it's not advice, but something that'd be really interesting for me because I've been doing so much reading through the Nakamoto Institute, which, in my opinion, is just it's arguably top three most important websites in all of crypto. Yeah, Nick Zabel is exceptional. Yeah, in his writing. Yeah, I just. I would love to know who Satoshi was because you start to like, there's a lot of different people on that website, like Ian Gregg, you know, Nick Zabo, you know, Hal Finney, all those guys. Um, I'm just constantly wondering, I'm like, who is Satoshi? And, you know, on the note of Nick Zabo, I'm just going to harp for a second if that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the stuff that Nick Zabo has written, I'm a huge, you know, I'm just a crazy fan about the idea of social scalability. You know, that I don't know if you've read the piece, but it's just one of those ones that Bitcoiners constantly harp on. And basically the way I understand social scalability is that uh, social scalability is basically a person's ability to interact with an institution without having to, without, without a high degree of mental cost, right? Like you can, for example, like you spend your dollars every day, you don't even think about it, right? Because there's not like a stupid degree of inflation, you know? There is inflation, obviously, we all know about it. That's like part of the reason why we're all, we're all here. But to an extent, yeah, it's the ability to engage with an institution without having to think about it very much. So how does this apply to crypto, right? You start to think about two different things, right? The ledger layer and the social layer. The ledger layer, absolute assurance. The ability for a coin to provide absolute assurance, you don't have to think about it, right? You're like, Bitcoin pumps out blocks every 10 minutes. Decred does it every five minutes, right? And what degree of reliability can I place on these balances? Can I hold my money in this? Can I be assured that my money is not going to get blocked from transacting. Am I, can I be assured that nobody's going to come take my money, you know, like a bank, right? Like if I keep my dollars in the bank and then I, I'd sell, I'd sell it, I just start buying drugs and selling drugs through my bank account. They shut me down, right? So at that level, absolute assurance builds one part of the pillar for social scalability. And then part two is predictability within the social layer, right? And I think Decred does that very well. So I think to an extent... Um, if you haven't read the piece, you might as well go read it. It's really good. But, um, you know, that, that whole piece is part, has, fi has kind of filled out part of my Decred investment thesis. And I think Decred is socially scalable in that, to that extent. So, yeah. But those are my thoughts about Satoshi. I would love to know who Satoshi is. Holler at me on Twitter, Satoshi, if you want to check in. Who do you think Satoshi is? Who do I think Satoshi is? Oh, I don't really know. This is an interesting question. Uh, combination of Ian Gregg and Nick Zabo. Ian Gregg wrote, so like uh, the, the piece that I'm going to publish about the Bitcoin as an accounting revolution, Ian Gregg, he is a, uh, he wrote this piece called Triple Entry Accounting. And you know, a lot of people talk about crypto being triple entry accounting, but you start reading through the piece. So this is funny. So he published it December 25th, Christmas day of 2005 or something like that. And you know, the Bitcoin white paper was published Halloween, October 31st, 2008, if I'm not mistaken. So I would not, I don't know, I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist a little bit that there is, a, that's non coincidental that, you know, like holidays, you know, special days like that. And then just when you start reading through the triple entry piece, you really start to realize like this guy gets it. Like this guy understood how Bitcoin worked before Bitcoin worked. It's really cool. So, but yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's it. So give me some of your closing thoughts and a message to newcomers and potential stakeholders in Decred. So my thoughts, my closing thoughts on Decred, uh, stack it while it's cheap for sure. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, if you, if this is your first time hearing about Decred, you just need to understand that this project is just so overlooked, you know? Like I've, you know, like I've constantly harped on, the accounting scheme is just out of control. Um, and when I say out of control in a good way, you know, it's just 
provides a very high degree of reliability. If you if you want to read more about it, you can actually read my Assurances in Crypto article. I think it, it, it dives into it and how it does like certain trade-offs with Bitcoin, how it stands out from the crowd. Um, and then in terms of tickets, you know, I just think over time, you know, the uh, the uh, the market at large will be paying a lot more attention to tickets. It's going to be one of those things just because it's so explicitly, you know, focused on savers and you know profit seeking, uh, motivated behavior that they're going to become a big thing. So yeah, for everybody that. Uh, you know, is entering into Decred and, you know, obviously look into the governance stuff. There's a lot of different ways you can get involved with the project. So yeah, just look into everything and uh, yeah, just over time, stack some Decred. This is a great time to do it. Right at the end of the bull, begin, right at the end of the bear, beginning of the bull, you can't go wrong with it. I agree. So let's get into the bulletproof section now. Um, I'm going to go over some questions and some statements that I gathered online and play devil's advocate for a bit. Right. So if Decred was to fail, what would be the cause of its death? If Decred was to fail. You know, I think, uh, I think it's like we talked about a little bit before. I think it'd be, uh, you know, the project getting big, blowing up, and then the governance scheme kind of getting overrun by new people coming. Bad actors. Yeah, bad actors, people coming in and, uh, you know, taking over the project. But like we talked about before, you know, this is just a unique thing with cryptocurrencies. Just everything just demands so much of your attention. You know, you can do the crypto space part-time, but like Decred just in so many different ways just demands your attention if you are a profit motivated while holding the coin, which is beautiful, right? Skin in the game. It's a legit thing. So, but if I was going to pick a way that the project would, uh, you know, fall apart at some point, it would be that basically the community just gets overrun instead of just, you know, usually what you want to do with the community is you don't want to get overrun and you don't want to push everybody out, right? What you want to do is uh, assimilate. So if there's good quality assimilation within the, uh, the Decred community, the governance scheme will scale very well. But there is a possibility that, you know, it doesn't. So if I was going to pick one way, that would be what goes wrong. So second statement we got here. Some say it's good for it to be difficult to change consensus. Decred does nothing special other than draw focus to a specific activation method baked into the protocol layer, which could be ported into any other project. Thoughts? So, you know, first of all, so there's two different questions in there, I guess, right? It's like some people think it should be difficult to change consensus. And then part two is basically talking about open source a little bit, right? So I'll, I'll hit on open source and then I'll hit on the difficult to change consensus. So with regards to open source, you know, this is an open source paradigm, you know, for example, people, that's like the same, it's like almost the equivalent of saying like, people should, everybody could copy proof of work, right? But how many proof of work coins are out there? Are out there? None of them are Bitcoin, right? So there's one thing to say, like you can implement something you, you can add something, but the way it's actually applied and implemented and the, uh, the resource commitment, the emotional commitment, the intellectual commitment, the actual way that it, the whole thing is carried out is very different, right? It's like telling me like, I can swing a baseball bat, but you know, I'm not going to hit a 90 mile an hour fastball. You can't, you can't copy the decred leaders in the community. Yeah, you can't. And just, you it's know- It's built on the social layer. Yeah, the social layer, you know, that's the thing. The social layer is a very soft thing and a lot of people have a lot of trouble- you know, digesting that. But yeah, I mean, that, that kind of argument just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, Decred's doing, doing a good thing with its uh, governance layer. Yeah, people are welcome to come copy it, but good luck being Decred. So we'll see. And then part two to this question is, it should be difficult to change consensus. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. You know, what you want is you want to be able to change consensus in a way that doesn't cause forks and it's highly predictable, right? You know, that's the beauty of the whole Decred thing. You, you download the new wallet, for, the new client version, and you have, you have it running dormant. And then when the protocol changes get updated, it goes in, right? So that's very predictable, safe, very scalable. You can do that. And I don't think that consensus needs to be difficult to change. It just needs to be what the people actually want, right? You know, with Bitcoin, they wanted SegWit. They eventually got it. You know, it's difficult to change, but it was like insanely messy, right? So with Decred, you know, difficult to change consensus is not the right way to phrase it. You want something that's predictable, that has the great balance of not able to be gamed and mental costs that are involved. 
And that's exactly what you want to push through consensus changes. So I don't know if that's the correct way to phrase it. You want it to be just, you know, predictable and safe, right? Predictable and safe. That's all you need. Definitely. So let's go. In, let's get into the third one. Bitcoin launched without a pre-mine. All other projects outside of Bitcoin are built around the financial interest of their creators. Yeah, I don't know. It sounds like a butthurt no corner who put that. But um, you know, it, it, I mean, I have to agree with it partially. Yeah, but uh, I just I just don't see anything wrong with it. Yeah, I I don't see anything wrong with the way Decred launched. So just for the first part of that question, you know. There's nothing wrong with doing a pre-mine because everything was just so, you know, you look back, so I wasn't, so I was actually in the space at that time. I just didn't know about it, right? I wish I did. Um, shout out to everybody who bought the pre the bought the, the pre-mine and whatnot. But uh, yeah, the uh, I'm completely cool with uh, the Decred pre-mine. You know, it's not Bitcoin, but at the end of the day, the one way you could look at it is that, you know, at least the project didn't sell out to a bunch of, you know, large financial institutions and stuff like that out the gate. You know, you get a lot of that with these ICOs. That's where like, the problem is like, these are bottom up phenomenons, right? These are the people's money. You know, we already have top down money issuance, right? We get that from the government. These monies are community driven, right? So the number one thing you want to make sure you do when you launch a project, for example, with Bi you know, Bitcoin has like the immaculate conception. You're never going to beat that, right? The number one thing you want to do is that you don't violate the social contract that you take on with all the community members, right? So to that extent, Decred has not violated that. It's been quiet. I mean, we are three years into the project and it's still quiet, right? Yeah. So to an extent, you know, it, I don't like, so like what you start to see with a lot of these type of things is that people push out these blanket statements and just because like the Bitcoin just happened to do it perfectly, you know, which it did, you know, we're all here because of Bitcoin started this whole thing, right? It started the whole phenomenon. It it just doesn't make sense to me to push that blanket stuff on people. What really matters is like, so we, we don't know. We don't know exactly what was pre-mined. We don't know if Team Satoshi bought ASICs and had them built before. Like there's there's just a lot of unknown. But from what's present, yes, it, it is the immaculate conception. Yeah. So, but the way Decred launched, you know, and I'm not trying to create an echo chamber here. Yeah. You know, I like to... No, Keith, let it rip. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of transparency in the team. Yeah. And getting to know the guys personally, um, which which will be difficult for most investors. You know, not, not everyone's going to ha have a chance to be on the inside. But from what I've gathered, it's it makes it makes me feel great about the project. And it, I mean, it's why I'm here. Yeah. You know? I mean, I don't think any of us would be here if we didn't like fully believe in the project. And yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe Bitcoin's not a scam yet. But there's no, you know, to an extent, you know, some of this stuff, it matters. Like the social stuff does matter because that's how you build a community and that's how you keep the project going. But the stuff that's never, ever going to be a scam are the hard stuff, right? Like the fact that proof of work solved the double spending problem and that it provides us with a higher degree of reliability in terms of accounting for stuff. You know, that's not a scam. You know, that's here. That's here to stay. That's a big deal. And Decred, you know. Maybe some people don't like the pre-mine, but like, you're not going to like, you look in the community, very healthy. Everyone's just like, here's an example of like how like committed to the project the community is. The Decred ticket buying volume on a 24 hour span, which is 288 blocks is larger than the trading volume on average on exchanges. That I didn't know. Yeah. Like we're like speculating, I guess. No, we're like kind of just like neck deep and we're not leaving. You know what I'm saying? Like people are like, oh, I don't like the pre-mine. I'm like. Well, that's like too bad because like, you know, the hybrid proof of work, proof of stake, the governance, the community, the devs, all the stuff that's being built on top of it, the synergies just all across the board. You know, I mean, fine, don't buy it. I don't care. I'm, that's why I constantly say I'm very cool with letting the market decide what's what because I'm just like so, like I told you in my one word feelings about Decred, hyper bullish on it because everything is just done so well and it's amazing just going from zero to one. And then just like another thing with Decred, this is just like, I'm just kind of rambling at this point, but I'm going to say it anyways. You know, Decred created like a, a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake monopoly. There's like no other coins that are like hybrid proof of work, proof of stake. So the fact that it's just completely dominated that like so early for so many years and nobody realizes like how awesome it is, is like the entrenched uh, level of leadership that it has just in that vertical is amazing. I'm sure others will come. It's oh. again, back to the social layer, the community that we built. Oh yeah. So here's a crack at the, at the dev fund. People will invest in things that make the world better, whether it be time or money, 
they will invest. You don't need a dev fund embedded into your protocol to incentivize development. Making the world a better place is a pretty strong incentive. I mean, yeah, I guess. But this was taken from Twitter when Jack announced that he was going to invest into Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, sure, that's like, that's cool. But the only way that, here's the truth, right? This is what this whole half of like the reason why the, uh, you know, the, the Bitcoin or Decred validation scheme works is that because it programs incentives, right? The, like, I don't like, I admittedly don't donate a lot to charity, right? I don't, like I, I do a little bit, but not a lot. And because the incentives are not good, you're sending your money to this large institution that's probably like 70% of it is just gonna go to pay its staff and then 30% actually goes towards actual outreach, right? So the thing that they're talking about is like, that's a, making the world a better place is a strong incentive. I'm like, yeah, it is. But like, people need to like, people need explicit, obvious, uh, selfish incentives too, right? You need- well, well charity is coming to blockchain too, which will streamline some of that. No, it'll be good. You know, like I think it'll be really cool to like, for example, you like there's a QR code on your TV screen when they show like an ad, and you just like you pull up your phone, your phone wallet, and just it'll scan direct, it. It'll go directly to your wallet. Yeah, I mean that's really cool. So I mean I'm all about charity, but you know sometimes. Interest, you know, incent- when we're talking about incentives, incentives need to be uh, outside of you and within. The outside one, yeah, sure, you want to make the world a better place, but, you know, some you don't get world-class decred devs for free. It just doesn't happen, you know. So unless they stacked coins really cheap and got into the crypto paradigm really early, I, I mean, I just don't know any other way to do it. And, you know, just at a high level, the dev, you know, the dev fund, that's not the dev fund, I'm calling it the treasury. The treasury you know, it's, it's helped in the bear market. You know, it's one of those things that it provides a cushion in the bear market and it, it, uh, it allows for expansion in the bull. You want that, right? You want things that it's very trend friendly. So to an extent, I, I just can't agree with this. Oh, it's, it's real power will come in a bull market. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And there's not like a, it's just one of those things just because Decred was just still quiet in the 2017 mania. In comparison, yes, very quiet. Yeah, but I think- when this thing starts outperforming and people start to understand why, you know, this is going to, the treasury fund is going to be one of the reasons why. I mean, it's also just one of those things. Everyone has this like purest, uh, you know, idealism that everything needs to be done the way Bitcoin, the way Bitcoin was done. What Decred is doing is that it fills all the gaps that Bitcoin doesn't do. You know what I'm saying? So to an extent, you know, Sure, it works for Bitcoin, and I'm very happy with the way things work in Bitcoin in general, right? It's just, it's different. But Decred does it a different way without violating the social contract, remaining socially scalable, super secure, and built in a good way for the future. So I just can't, I can't agree with the fact that the treasury is a bad thing. It's a good thing. Well, Jordan, I appreciate you taking the time to, to do this interview. Um, where can people find you? Um, you can find me at Twitter. My name is Permable Nino on Twitter, but my uh, actual tag is I'ma call you Jody, which is uh, my friends call me Jod as a as a nickname. But uh, yeah, so that's about it, though. All right, brother. Thanks for coming on. All right, man. Thanks for having me.